In this unit, our discussion is going to be the periodic table. After a brief introduction, we're going to talk about some historical aspects of the development of the periodic table as we know it today. The organizational scheme on the table, the position of elements and their electron configurations, and how the two relate. We'll talk about types of elements and the all-important progression of properties when we deal with such things as ionization potentials, electron affinities, isoelectronic series, all manner of things of that time. Under historical aspects, we're going to take a period of time from 1815 to the mid-1900s. We'll start with William Prout, talk about the contributions of Dubereiner and Newlands. We'll talk about Mendeleev, Meyer, Mosley, and Chadwick. William Prout produced his work in 1815 and suggested that hydrogen was the fundamental particle. He, it was his opinion that other elements were groupings of hydrogen atoms. Therefore, the atomic weights of elements should be multiples of the atomic weight of hydrogen. An interesting idea. In about 15 years later, Dubereiner gave us the concept we call triads. What he did was note that properties of elements in their compounds appeared to be the average of the properties of two other elements in their compounds. For example, consider the atomic weights of lithium, sodium, and potassium. Now the atomic weight known at the time for lithium was 7 and for potassium was 39. Well, if you take 7 and 39, add them together, get 46, divide by 2, you will find that sodium should have an atomic weight of 23. And ladies and gentlemen, it's very, very close. But he didn't just do this with the elements. He did it with their compounds also. Look, for example, at the melting point of the halides of sodium. Sodium chloride melts at about 800 degrees. Sodium iodide at about 660 degrees. Add the two, divide by two, get the average, and the actual melting point of sodium bromide is pretty close to that average. Newlands, in 1865, gave us the law of octaves. Now, he listed the elements in order of increasing atomic weights. And what he found was every eighth element had properties of the first element. Every eighth element had properties of the first element, so he grouped them. And he literally developed the first periodic table. But folks, it was not readily accepted. Here's the table that he proposed. Now look at it. These were the elements that were known of the day. Do you see what's missing? What's missing on there? Yeah, the noble gases are missing. Exactly. Do you see some of his problems that he had? Look, he listed them in order of increasing atomic weights but he grouped them by similar properties. Or he tried to group them so that every eighth element or thereabouts was together. He had problems here. Now, folks, the similar properties should have been in the vertical columns. Well, fluorine, chlorine, cobalt, or nickel, and bromine don't necessarily have the same properties. The same thing is true over here on the right. Oxygen and sulfur are very similar, but iron, I don't think so. Look at the third element, hydrogen, lithium, and then, instead of beryllium, it's GL. GL is glycinium. It was named that because of its sweet taste. But later, with further work, it was called beryllium. Dmitry Mendeleev of Russia was working during that same time period 
along the same lines and listed the elements horizontally in order of increasing atomic weights, just as Newlands had done. But Mendeleev also listed the elements or grouped them vertically by similar chemical properties, and he did it in a little different fashion than the way that it was done by Newlands. He recognized and adjusted for some variations and developed what became the basics of the folded form, or it's sometimes called the short form, of the periodic table. Now, one thing that he did that was different. Look at the next elements that, he, that Mendeleev knew after calcium. He knew titanium and vanadium. But when he put them here, they didn't match. When he took the properties of boron and titanium and averaged them, he did not get the properties of aluminum, as he would have expected from Newland's work. When he took the properties of carbon and silicon, they are so very similar, but not at all like vanadium. They're more like titanium. The properties didn't fit. So he moved the elements over and recorded a blank there and said, this is an element that has not yet been discovered. He did this in a number of places. Here, let me show you a portion of his table. Now look at this table that Mendeleev produced in 1869. Look at the question marks that are on here. Do you see following calcium, there is a question mark. And he figured the atomic, mass, the atomic weight of that element. He figured its properties. He did a number of things. And if you look through this table, you will see several other places. And had I given you the entire table, you would have noticed a number of these question marks. And it is a tribute to Mendeleev that his table was very, very useful because during his lifetime, he saw several of these elements discovered and characterized exactly as he had predicted. It was a magnificent piece of work, probably, probably of intellectual equivalence at least to Bohr's atomic theory. There's something else I would like to point out about his table. Look here, see the formula, a ferret group one, the R superscript two O. They used superscripts instead of the subscripts that we use in today's table or when we're writing today's formulas. Look here at titanium, where titanium was thought to have been placed by Newlands. But look, these are grouped in accordance with these formulas. In this case, the element, two atoms of that with three atoms of oxygen. That didn't work for titanium. Titanium worked here, where it was RO2, or titanium TiO2. And, of course, another way of denoting the compounds were to denote, to denote the hydrides. This was another point of comparison. And all of these in this column had four hydrogens. Mendeleev's table had tremendous predict predictive value, and that is why it became so widely accepted. Now here's a short form of a periodic table that was being used in college textbooks back in, in 1940 and on for a few years after. And it's essentially Mendeleev's table from, from 1869. But over on the left, do you see group zero? And there you have the noble gases on the left. In Germany, Lothar Meyer, in 1870, devised an arrangement of elements very similar to that of Mendeleev. But instead of using chemical properties as Mendeleev had done, Meyer used physical properties. Now, he is certainly given credit for his work, but he is listed secondarily to Mendeleev. Why? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, Mendeleev's work was so predictive of the chemical properties and it became such an important reference. And also, it's very possible that Mendeleev published his thoughts before Meyer did. 
Mosley, in 1913, determined atomic numbers using the relationship between wavelengths of X-rays and the elements producing those X-rays. And Chadwick, in 1932. Chadwick discovered neutrons. They had long thought neutrons existed, but they weren't able to, to define it. They weren't able to determine it. Beca and these neutrons were important because they explained the difference in the atomic masses of the isotopes. But how did it happen that he discovered it? Let me tell you about that. What is this atom? Wh what does it look like? How do we know and why is it important? For hundreds of years, scientists have looked for these answers. They've tried to figure out what the atom might look like. But is it really necessary? In the first place, seeing an atom is not easy. How do you see things? You bounce photons off of them. They come back to the eye and are received, or to some detector and are received. The problem is the things we might bounce off of an atom in order to see it are too large. So what we have to do is develop a model of the atom based on current research. The current research tells us the atom behaves a certain way, so we devise a model that will explain and describe and predict that behavior. And as more information and research comes in, we have to change our model to meet those, those new informations that we're getting. The idea is that we want to develop a model that will allow us to explain to some extent and importantly to predict behavior. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the historical view of the atom and we're going to look at it through the eyes of the researchers and we're going to look at these as they try to determine how the atom is behaving when they evolve, when they see these characteristics that are evolving. Expect our models to change. So the models that we're using in this lecture may not be the models that are used several years from now. But the idea is, it gives us a way to project and predict. Let's look now at the organization on the table. We will look at several of the families and some of their descriptions. We'll talk about periods and we will introduce some of the special groups. First, the alkali metals. Notice the alkali metals are characterized by the number 1A. Quite frankly, on the more modern periodic tables, it may just be called the number 1. Observe hydrogen is not an alkali metal. Sometimes hydrogen is placed over with the seven A's. Sometimes hydrogen is placed on a, a block by itself in the middle of the table. 
but most of the tables are currently listing it over here in the 1A family because of the number of electrons it has in its only and outer shell. But it is not an alkali metal. The properties of the alkali metals, they're very soft, reactive metals. They have one electron in their valence shell. And they tend to form basic solutions in water. Now, hydrogen does not fit the first and last one of those, but we still group it with the 1As, but it is not an alkali metal. Let's look at the reactions of a couple. There's sodium metal in water. You very well may have seen it for yourself. It can react pretty vigorously. And the solution that is produced is very very basic. Let's look at cesium metal. Ah, look how rapidly that reacted. How very rapidly. And it also produces a basic solution. Now let's look at the alkaline earths. In the alkaline earths, we have the 2A family, beryllium all the way down the line. And the properties of the alkaline earths, they are reactive metals. Not so reactive, probably, as the alkali metals, but they are definitely reactive. They have two electrons in their valence shell. And they also tend to form basic solutions in water. The properties of the alkaline earth. Well, let's see, where shall we go now? Let's go over here to group 7a in the family that's called the halogens. Halogens means salt former, the halogens. And the properties of the halogens? Well, they are nonmetals and they are reactive nonmetals. They have seven electrons in their valence shell, their outer shell. And they tend to form acid solutions when in placed in water. Nonmetals, seven electrons in the valence shell, and very acetic solutions are produced, quite different from the ones over on the left-hand side of the table. Next, we have the noble gases. The noble gases have been called the inert gases, but that is definitely a misnomer. They are not as reactive as many of the others, but we can cause them to react. Their properties? Well, they are, for the most part, they're non-reactive, but they can be made to react under some pretty strong circumstances. They have eight electrons in the valence shell, with the exception of helium, which only has two. Okay, let's look at periods now. Here's our first period. It contains hydrogen and helium. The second period, lithium through neon. The third period, sodium. You see, and the period numbers are on the left-hand side. The fourth period, it's getting quite long, isn't it? The fifth period, now, something about the sixth period you may find interesting. Look at this. The lanthanides actually should be stacked like a deck of cards and tucked behind lanthanum, and they are part of the sixth period, even though we pull them out and list them separately as the lanthanides. And for the actinides, the same thing happens. These should be stacked like a deck of cards and placed behind actinium if you will, but we pull them out and treat them separately, and there's a lot of reason for that. This entire group of elements that we have, have blocked here and the ones that are headed with the B representation are called the transition elements. These are the transition elements. These are the inner transition elements, a portion of the inner transition elements, the lanthanides. 
Another portion of the inner transition elements is this group that we call the actinides. Let's look at position on the periodic table and electron configuration. We've given you several ways of trying to remember how to do electron configurations, but you don't need those anymore because the periodic table will give you an excellent way of noting electron configurations. Let's start out by looking at some key groupings on the table. These are the S block elements. Why are they S block? They are S block because their outer electrons are in the S orbital of that particular energy level. For period one, hydrogen and helium, their last electrons are in the 1s. For lithium and beryllium, in the 2s. Sodium and magnesium, in the 3s. And so forth on down. Cesium and barium, in the 6s. Those are called the S block elements. These are called the P block elements. Boron, for example, is 2p with 1 in it, 2px with 1. Carbon is 2p with 2 in it, or 2px1, py1, and so forth all the way across until you hit neon, which is 2p6, or 2px2, py2, pz2. And you look down at, at the very, very bottom row. Not the very bottom row, because we don't have that filled in. But look at radon. Radon has 6P6. Six six. Lead has 6P2. These are the D block elements. These are all placing electrons in the D. Now, I would like to be able to tell you that scandium has one in the D, and titanium has two, and vanadium has three, and chromium has four. And for the most part, that's about the way it goes. But there are some little oddities that we run into in there, and we will explain those in just a moment. The F block elements. The F block elements are placing those last electrons in the F subshell, or the F orbital. Let's use the periodic table and give the electron configuration for lead. Now lead is right here on the table. And what we're going to do is start with hydrogen up here in this corner and go all the way through until we hit lead. Now just as a quick review, remember, these are filling the S these are filling the P, these are filling the D, and these are filling the F subshells. All right, let's start with hydrogen. We go across hydrogen and helium, and that is 1s2. Now we do lithium and beryllium for 2s2. Now, boron through neon for 2p6. Where now? Okay, down here to the 3s. And 3s with 2. Keep on going. All the way across here. That's 3p with 6. We go here with 4s. And you remember that these back up a level right here? This is the 3D. And we go all the way across there. So it's 3D with 10. And now we are marching across here. And that is 4P with 6. Now, across here we have the 5S with 2. And here... Yes, that's right. Let's go straight on through there. That is the 4D with 10. Now we have the 5P 
with 6, we're getting close. We go through the 6s with 2. And now we would start here with a lanthanum, but you see that it immediately goes down into the lanthanides. So we're going to go all the way across the lanthanides. And remember, that's two subshells, two shells removed. So that is 4, F, 14. We have that now. We've done the 4, F, 14. Now we come back and we do, that's right, the 5, D with 10. And we only have two more to go, here and here. And that's in the 6P. So it's 6, P, X with 1 and P, Y with 1. And that takes care of our electron configuration. So much better than having to memorize the order of filling. Let's show you a shorthand notation for doing electron configuration using the noble gas core. What we do is we drop back to the closest previous noble gas as the core of our configuration like this. Let's give the configuration for phosphorus number 15. Now here's phosphorus on the periodic table and what we will do is drop back to neon right here and we will write it like this. We will write neon and then we will give the electrons all along the arrow that I just marked and it looks like this. Here's neon. We put neon in brackets. That means everything up to that point is the electron configuration of neon. Now, we give 3s2, 2px1, py1, pz1, which takes care of covering sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, and stopping at phosphorus. Do you see how it works? It saves a lot of time and a lot of writing and it does give a very clear electron configuration. Now let's give the electron configuration for lead number 82. Yes, I know you've done it before, but this time we're going to do it using the shorthand method. Alright, what noble gas do we use? We want to go to lead, so we're going to use xenon. So here is xenon. Now where do we have to go? We have to cross cesium and barium. So that's going to be 6s2. And that takes us over to lanthanum. But when we go to lanthanum, that's going to drop us down. It's going to drop us down to the lanthanides. And that is going to be 4f14. Now we've gotten that, we come back up and we go across here, and that is going to be 5D10, and we go over and pick up the 6PX1 and the 6PY1. And here it is. The 6S2, covering cesium and barium, the 4F14, going all the way down and picking up those lanthanides, then coming back up, picking up the rest of the, the ones in that transition series, picking up 5D10, then we hit 6PX1 and PY1, and we have the electron configuration of lead done in a much more painless fashion, if you will. And here we will end Lesson 1. Now when we come back for Lesson 2, we're going to talk about types of elements. But before we do that, we'll have a look at a couple other interesting periodic tables. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.